tend to measure how we think our God feels about us with what's going on in our lives, right? If everything is going well, then we figure God is pleased with us. If something bad happens, then we think God is angry with us. So as long as things are going well, we don't have to pay too much attention, do we? That's the false security that our worship theme speaks about. Because only in our God do we have what is lasting, eternal security. And our God leads us to him through his word and in his sacrament. That's where we find our God, and that's where our security is. Our God simply calls us to repent of our sins, and when we do, he assures us of our forgiveness. There is the security that he wants us to have on a daily basis. And our God reminds us of it this morning. May you find that security in your Savior, Jesus Christ, as you worship him this morning. A good morning and a welcome to all of you. If you're using your hymnal for today's order of worship, it's found on page 38. If you're worshiping virtually with us today, please send me a text message or an email. That information is useful to me. Let's join now in the opening hymn number 339. Savior, I pray, 
Have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this Moses hid his face, because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. This is the word of the Lord. The sound of the day is number 85. Listen as the organist plays an introduction, and then we'll join together in singing the refrain of the verses of the sun. <laughs> Yes, sir. 
reminds us that even some of the chosen Israelites fell into grievous sins and lost God's gift of salvation. If we trust in our own efforts to stand firm in the faith, we too will fall. God, however, promises us the strength needed to overcome temptation and win the victory. This reading will serve in a minute as our sermon text. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples, and were written down as warnings for us, on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. This is the word of the Lord. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Please stand for today's gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke chapter 13. The Lord urges us to repent in this reading before us. We can still come in his grace to forgive us, but there will come a time when God's grace will run out. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree, and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, Leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. This is the gospel of our Lord. use these things right here some safety glasses especially if I'm trimming with a weed whacker because I don't want that weed whacker to shoot something up like a stone or a little piece of a stick and hurt my eyes so I wear safety glasses like this they protect me and when I'm mowing I usually I'm not even weed whacking or even using a leaf blower I use this to deaden the noise so I don't damage my ear the, this headset here protects my ears I'll bet you have helmets at home, don't you, when you ride your bike? Yeah, you have a helmet so that it protects you, and you're glad. If you ever fall off of your bike and you fall down on the ground, your head is going to be protected. You might skin your knee, but you won't hurt your head. In one of our readings this morning, God related to us, he reminded us of all the ways in which he protected his people, the children of Israel. He protected them from Pharaoh's army. He provided food and water for them. He always took care of them. Unfortunately, the people weren't as thankful as they should have been. They should have remembered how God protected them, but instead, they fell into sin. They did things that were wrong. They forgot about God. That's an easy thing to do. 
People get so busy, especially when you're an adult, get so busy just living your life from day to day that we forget all about God, or we think we're doing fine without Him. When in reality, we sin every day, don't we? And what we need to be doing, as Jesus said in the Gospel, is to repent. We need to repent of our sins and trust in Jesus for our forgiveness. And then no matter what else happens, we're okay, we're good, we're fine, we're perfect with God. We have a perfect relationship with Him through Jesus Christ. And that helps us then know that no matter what else is happening in our lives, it'll be okay because Jesus is going to take care of you in the way that He wants. Okay, you go back and sit with your parents. We'll sing the hymn of the day, number 337. Our God did not simply cause his writers 
to recount all the wonderful accounts of God's people in his kingdom. No, so often God caused his writers also to record the terrible choices and the evil things they decided to do in order that we might learn from them. King Solomon once said, there's nothing new under the sun. And that is certainly true when it comes to temptation and falling into sin. Satan doesn't create any new temptations. He re recycles and repackages old temptations and brings them out new to us every day. And unless we learn from the past, we're only destined or doomed to repeat those same sins, fall into the same sins, and the problems that it causes us and our loved ones. In these words before us this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul takes the Corinthian Christians back 1,500 years to the time when God was dealing daily with his people, the children of Israel. He encouraged them in this, this section to take note of what happened, to recall the history, and to learn from it. As modern Christians, our God would have us do the same this morning. To take a look at history, Bible history, learn from Bible history. Let's see what our God wants us to know and the strength that he gives us through his word and his faithful presence. I never get tired of watching tremendous displays of power. For instance, watching the flyby of the United States Air Force and the jets that are flying so low overhead. The power, the speed, the agility of those fighter jets is awesome. I never tire of seeing a rocket launch. It impresses me, the technology and the power necessary to lift that massive missile off of the pad and into outer space. Incredible. I never tire of seeing those displays of power. The children of Israel, too, witnessed tremendous displays of God's power as he led them out of slavery in Egypt. Paul reminds us of several of those displays of power, and in doing so, he takes us back into Bible history, and he calls for us to learn from it. He says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud, and they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. Paul reminded the Corinthians how the glory of the Lord appeared to the children of Israel in the form of a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And that pillar of cloud and that pillar of fire protected them and guided them on their journey. It was an awesome display of God's power and his presence. Part one, lesson one in Bible history. In lesson two, Paul reminded them how the Lord parted the waters of the Red Sea so that the children of Israel could go through the Red Sea on dry ground with a water of wall on their left and on their right. And they could recall how later then God would cause that, those walls of water to come crashing down on Pharaoh and destroy Pharaoh and his army. Tremendous display of God's power and his presence among them. Bible history lesson number two. In lesson three, Paul recalled how the Lord miraculously fed the children of Israel with manna for 40 years and also with water from the rock. He was there to provide for them, to protect them from starvation, from de dehydration. What awesome power and what presence. These were just a few of the displays of God's power that the children of Israel witnessed not just once or twice, but on a daily basis. But it wasn't only God's power that was so awesome for them. No, it was also his grace. And Paul points that out. He said that they drank from the spiritual rock, and that rock was Christ. The eternal Son of God was present with them on a daily basis. He was there with his grace, calling them to repentance and assuring them of his forgiveness reminding them that his promise to them was that he would use that nation in order to bring the Savior into the world. What grace! But by and large, the people despised God's grace. 
Listen to the results. <laughs> Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. The vast majority of the children of Israel who witnessed these awesome displays of God's power rejected him as the God of their salvation. And the vast majority of them died in unbelief in the desert. That's Paul's point. Here was this awesome display of God's power and his grace, and yet the people misused it. Don't abuse the grace of God is lesson number one. But that wasn't the only issue at hand. Since God was gracious to them, the children of Israel used his mercy and his grace as a license to sin. And Paul notes the tremendous sins they fell into. He says, now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. Paul goes into part two now of his Bible history lesson. And the first lesson he wants them to learn is that they, they points out what happened while Moses was on top of Mount Sinai receiving the law from the Lord. The children of Israel were at the foot of Mount Sinai worshiping a golden calf and engaging in pagan revelry. Violations of commandment one. They failed to resist temptation. In Bible history lesson number two, Paul referred to the incident in which the people interacted with the heathen nation of Moab. The people of, the, of Moab had failed to get Balaam to put a curse on God's people, so they decided to do something else in order to incur God's wrath. The Moabite women seduced the Israelite men into temple worship of their false gods, which, in, which included temple prostitution, violations of, gross violations of commandments number one and six. And what happened? Paul says 23,000 of them died. They indulged their sinful natures. In lesson number three, Paul reminded the Corinthians how God's people grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And God sent poisonous snakes. And many of them died. And in lesson number four, he points out how a segment of the Levites decided that Moses and Aaron were no longer the leaders that they wanted. So they usurped the authority of Moses and Aaron. And the angel of death came. And nearly 15,000 died. His point, don't play with sin. Don't indulge the sinful nature. Resist temptation. Paul's first two lessons from Bible history were all about the children of Israel and their negative reactions to the grace of God and his patience. In the third lesson, Paul speaks about something far greater. He speaks about the Lord God. And he says it like this. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Lesson number three from history, God is faithful. Faithful. The first thing our faithful God does is he calls sinful people to repent. As we heard in the gospel earlier, that is his will. God does not want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Jesus pointed that out again and again. His call to sinful people is to repent. A faithful God stands and calls people to repent every day of their lives. And when they do, when they confess their sin, God is faithful. He forgives because that's what he's all about. He is the God who is slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness. He forgives wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And then he stands by us. He stands by us with his presence. 
in order to strengthen us in the face of temptation, and as Paul points out, he provides a way out. He does not allow us to be tempted beyond what we can bear. He strengthens our faith in order that we can withstand the temptation at present and overcome it with the victory. God is faithful. Here's a statement, an understatement if there ever was one. Life is a struggle. Isn't that true? Life is a struggle. And I'm not simply referring to the fact that it's a daily struggle just to stay afloat, just to get through another day. I'm talking about the fact that each day is a tremendous spiritual struggle. We're up against Satan, all of his demons, an evil world, and our own sinful nature. Those deadly three want to rob us of our faith every second of every day of our lives, and we're no match for them on our own. But God is faithful. He is present with us. Moses talked about how the children of Israel were baptized by that water of the Red Sea with Moses, a veiled, a veiled reference to our own baptisms in which our God placed his name on us. Moses spoke about how the people ate and drank and drank from the spiritual rock which was Christ, a veiled reference to the Lord's Supper in which our God feeds and strengthens us so that we can withstand temptation and overcome and win the victory. Our God shares his word with us. He wants to share his word with us every day because it's through that word that we have a connection with him. And in that connection, the opportunity, the power to overcome and win the victory. That's what we need to learn from Bible history, that with our God, we can overcome. We can withstand the temptations of Satan, our evil world, and our sinful nature. We can stand in that power. Learn from history. Love the Lord your God and live in the power that he gives. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. We confess the Christian faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for a moment of meditation.
the soul of Carol Poland's sister, Karen, who will pray for those who mourn her passing. Heavenly Father, you loved the world and gave your Son to liberate us from sin and death by his obedient death on the cross. We confess that without your love, we are lost. Lord of the Church, we thank you for the treasure of the Gospel. By your Spirit, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Strengthen our determination to do what pleases you, no matter what the danger or the cost. Let us pray for those who carry a cross in the name of Christ and face ridicule and persecution for the sake of the kingdom, missionaries and chaplains, young people who stand up for what is right in the face of pressure to do what is wrong, and all who pay a high price for their faith and their values as Christians. By your Spirit, O Lord, grant them patience and endurance. Let us pray for those who carry heavy burdens in life, the sick and the chronically ill, the depressed and the lonely, those torn by conflict in personal relationships, those victimized by war and injustice, and all who face the terrors of life with a heavy heart. Grant them peace, O Lord, and in your mercy be their guardian and friend, their comfort and hope. Let us pray for those who care for others, pastors and counselors, physicians and nurses, social workers and caring friends, all who feed the hungry, comfort the hurting, and stand beside the dying. Strengthen them in their work, O Lord, and do not let them become weary in doing good. Lord God, in this world of darkness and evil, the light of your saving gospel continues to shine. Through that good news, you have brought people around the world from the darkness of sin and death and into your marvelous saving light. But evil exists, and Satan's work in this fallen world continues. As many in Ukraine are experiencing unimaginable hardships and suffering, we ask that you would be with them, protect them, provide for them, and above all, strengthen their faith and their trust in you and your promises. We commend them to your gracious care, knowing that you have promised to be with them always. Even though they are now walking through the valley of the shadow of death, enable them to fear no evil. We ask you in your love and wisdom to restore peace and safety to those now enduring the horrors of war and bloodshed, and to continue to let your gospel message be the comfort and hope that so many desperately need. And O oh Lord God, Lord of life and death, we thank you for all the mercies with which you've blessed Karen, now fallen asleep. We thank you especially for having brought her to the knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you would comfort her family and all who mourn her death with your precious promises and cheer them with the sure hope of a blessed reunion in heaven. Grant the lifeless body rest, and at last together with us all, a joyful resurrection to life everlasting. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain hearts of wisdom and finally be saved. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Help us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Keep us faithful even to the point of death that we may receive the crown of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the singing of the next hymn.
Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.
arbitrator. It's no secret that Christian churches in Europe have been in decline for many decades, drifting further and further from the truth of Scripture. As distressing as that is, it does provide an opportunity for a church that offers solid biblical teaching. These people are gathering to worship our Lord at the Wells Mission Church in London. What this group lacks in size, it makes up for in commitment. Members realize that the truths Wells teaches are missing in most other churches here. I think the religious institutions that are kind of native to this country have lost their way in uh, a lot of senses, um, and people are crying out for something more substantial. It was the most wonderful, deep, fabulous teaching that we've been longing for all our life, really, so it's been a brilliant, real life-changing experience. Because this group doesn't have a full-time pastor, they only meet once a month when the Wells chaplain from Germany visits. But that hasn't diminished their enthusiasm. As the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians, they're eager to be able to um, share their faith on a regular basis with, with each other, but also to reach out with their Christian faith to others. London may soon be getting a significant influx of Lutherans. The reason? China. As China cracks down on religious freedom in Hong Kong, many Christians are fleeing. And there's great concern about whether Christianity is going to be able to continue in Hong Kong as it has. And so we have found out that our sister church body in Hong Kong has had about 20% of their members move uh, over to England. As chapter 8 begins, says that that was actually the beginning of a fierce persecution in Jerusalem. Our Synod has responded to these events by making plans to call a full-time missionary to London to better meet the need and to take advantage of new opportunities. I've been praying for it very earnestly and I can't tell you how rejoiced I am, I just can't. I'm going to just wonder. is a truly international city, with immigrants from around the world arriving daily. People in transition are often open to hearing the good news of Jesus, and our mission is poised for this new opportunity. God willing, after the first missionary is established, a second will be added, perhaps focused specifically on serving people arriving from Hong Kong. While the door in Hong Kong may be closing, God is opening a new door in London. I'm sorry, I should have announced that before we began showing it. I usually do that. Thanks for staying with me and watching that. A little bit of an update. Since that uh, video was made, we did call a missionary. He did accept, and now we are in the process of de deciding whether or not to call a second missionary to join him. So things are going very well in London. Uh, it's my prayer that uh, you enjoyed your worship of your Savior here this morning, receiving the strength that he gives through his word to resist temptation, to give him a heart that is repentant, that trusts in him for your forgiveness, and that you have the ability now to go and live as those children, a, children of God, a child of God in the world out there. Just a couple of announcements. Uh, Easter flowers are available for purchase. It's a little different than it was in past years. There are several varieties of flowers and uh, there are uh, differences in the price. See the sign-up sheet on the bulletin board. Sign your name to a particular flower that you'd like to purchase and then take one of those envelopes and put the appropriate uh, amount of money in it and bring it back with you. The deadline for ordering is April uh, 3rd. We'll worship on Wednesday evening here, 7 o'clock, potluck supper at 6 o'clock. We invite all of you to join us. Those are the announcements. Have a blessed day.